we are going to have the uh, last lecture by uh, uh, Fabian Schmidt on the structure formation. So Fabian, uh, whenever you want to start, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Yes, so uh, welcome back uh, um, to the last lecture. It went by very quickly for me. I hope <laughs> it's the same for you. Um, great, so uh, now back into the outline, we're down here. Um, so today I wanted to um, um, continue obviously from yesterday in one aspect. So yesterday we had a bit of a tour de force of, of bias and we ended up with being able to compute the galaxy power spectrum, including its leading order correction uh, in what I call the rest frame. So if you think of knowing the intrinsic positions of the galaxies um, on the constant time slice, and then you could measure this, okay. Now it turns out that we don't quite have access to these galaxy positions because um, if you recall, how, how do we, um, you know, in order to um, measure galaxy clustering, we have to make a catalog of galaxies. And for that, we need um, positions. And of course, what when you observe a distant galaxy in a large survey, uh, we'll learn more about the surveys next week uh, from Dragon. Um, then we know the position on the sky of the galaxy and its observed redshift, right? And so in general, we need to take into account that the perturbations of the universe not only affect uh, where galaxies form, but they also affect the, the light propagation, the photon geodesics that connect us and the galaxies. So uh, there are several effects there, including gravitational lensing, but by far the most important one um, called us 3D galaxy clustering that I'm focusing on here is uh, the fact that the observed redshift has a component due to Doppler shift, right? So if, if the galaxies were really at rest respect the expanding universe, then the redshift would give us exactly the distance. Um, in an uh, in general unknown relation, right? That's something we want to measure is what's the relation between distance and redshift, but they would be in one-to-one -one correspondence with, with distance. Now, in reality, galaxies move. And so they add, that adds a contribution to the uh, redshift of the galaxy, which, you know, in classically we know as the Doppler shift, but you can also calculate fully relativistically. And in terms of co-moving position, it looks like this. So the observed position is the intrinsic position plus the line of sight velocity of the galaxy and hat is the line of sight um, divided by a h uh, and that is a shift along the line of sight. So what does this mean? Um, we, when we, these are 3D positions, right? So I need to convert from redshift to, um, from redshift to position. And um, so u dot n hat is the proper uh, perturbation to the uh, redshift, the dollar shift. And this one over a h converts from a small shift in redshift to small shift in distance. Okay. So, um, so what do we do then? So that has an effect on galaxy clustering because um, this field, the galaxy velocity is itself not uniform, right? There are perturbations in it. And um, well, it is a perturbation actually. And um, um, and so that, and that those perturbations of velocity are correlated themselves with the density perturbation. So that leads to quite a subtle interplay. So how do we do this? Um, we um, use number conservation, right? No matter uh, where we put the galaxy uh, in terms of observed position, we know that's there. So the number uh, of galaxies conserved under this transformation from X to X observed. And then we can do the same computation as we did for the Lagrangian perturbation theory. If you recall in, I believe it was the third lecture. Um, and we get this. So the observed galaxy density is the true intrinsic galaxy density uh, at the proper position that corresponds to X observed times this Jacobian factor, okay? And so now um, 
you know, we have this relation, uh, we can compute this Jacobian factor. And since this shift is first order in perturbation theory, we can actually um, do a similar perturbation theory expansion of this relation. And it's really, it doesn't add anything new except that it makes things slightly more, more complicated. Um, so I'm not gonna do, do that here, but just, you know, basically leave it there. Um, and I think um, hopefully it's clear that um, we can do this in perturbation theory. Um, so there's, again, there's two effects, the effect of evaluating the galaxy density at a different position and this Jacobian factor um, at leading order, at linear order, only this Jacobian factor leads to an effect and we'll get to that. Um, right. So, so to recap this whole story, uh, including the last lecture, um, to calculate the observed galaxy statistics, we need perturbation theory for matter. Uh, we need the bias expansion to get the rest frame galaxy density. And then we also need some kind of velocity ex expansion to get the galaxy velocity. And that turns out to be very simple, as we'll see. Um, and so then you put the three together in a consistent perturbation theory framework, and you just need to compute. So um, obviously, uh, galaxy velocities enter the observed galaxy statistics through this effect that we call, um, we call this effect redshift space distortions. It's a cumbersome term, but um, RSD in short. Um, and so um, how, how are galaxy velocities related to matter velocities, right? Do we have to do the same story as we did for the galaxy bias expansion, which was you know, quite a bit, quite tricky and also um, added a lot of free terms, free coefficients. Fortunately, it's much better for the galaxy velocity. Because now, if you imagine, um, if galaxy velocities are not equal to matter velocities, and in general, of course, they aren't, um, then I can, as a local observer with a dark matter detector, I mean, just as a thought example, I could imagine measuring the relative velocity between galaxies and mass, right? So that's a local observable. And we argued previously that things like the gravitational potential or the gradient of it or the velocity itself are not really local observables because I can go to another frame and uh, they look different or even are, are gone, right? I can transform away the gradient of phi by going to a free falling frame. Um, and so that means the galaxy velocities can't simply be like some constant factor times galaxy uh, matter velocities, okay? That cannot happen. Instead, um, the leading contribution, it turns out, um, I'm not gonna go through this, but the leading contribution to velocity bias, so the difference between galaxy and matter velocities, oh, apologies that I'm using me here. Um, I think this was imported from other slides, so it, it should be you, okay. Sorry about that. Um, uh, so the leading contribution is, so this is a vector, right? So we need some kind of vector, and it turns out that it's something like the gradient of the density field times some coefficient beta that we don't know. Um, but the key point is that gradient of delta has two additional derivatives relative to the equation for the velocity itself. So in other words, these velocity bias effects are suppressed by k squared in free space. They're basically similar to this effect of sound speed type corrections um, that we encountered before. Um, and that's not surprising at all, right? If you think about, let's not even consider galaxies, let's just consider gas, right? If gas has pressure forces, then its velocity will, the other equation uh, obtain, get the term gradient of the pressure. And, um, and that, uh, it's proportional to gradient of delta, uh, delta if you have a simple equation of state of the fluid. Right? So we basically expect precisely this kind of effect to appear for gas and so for galaxies, it's the same story. So to summarize, um, galaxy velocities are unbiased on large scales. That's a really, really important, um, uh, important fact. So then if we do expand this um, Jacobian factor and the relation between intrinsic and observed galaxy density, we get this relation. So we get the linear bias relation that we studied last lecture. We get a noise term um, that we had before, but we get an additional contribution that's 
given by the line of sight velocity of the line of sight, uh, sorry, line of sight derivative of the line of sight velocity, um, which comes from this Jacobian d3 x d3 x observed. Okay, so this is actually a nice thing. So it, it makes our um, our computation a bit more complicated, but it's it's a nice thing because now this thing doesn't have a bias coefficient, right? Um, because uh, the galaxy velocities are unbiased on large scales. So um, uh, yeah, this term we refer to as retrospace space distortions. So if you now um, to Fourier space um, and compute the galaxy power spectrum, um, so we transform this relation to Fourier space and take the square of it basically, then you get this expression if you do a little bit of computation and use the equation for the matter velocity. Um, so we get a term here uh, multiplying the, so first of all, what's important is that because of this term refers to line of sight, right? Only the line of sight component is affected by the Doppler shift. So that means the power spectrum now depends on whether the K vector is along the line of sight or perpendicular. Right? Perpendicular to line of sight, you don't have retrospace distortions. So if K dot N hat is zero, then this term goes away. But um, if k is parallel to a line of sight, then you have this term. And its coefficient is just given by the growth rate, d log d, d log a. Um, so it turns out that this factor of um, a h we had here cancels nicely with the a h in the relation between velocity and density. And so you get this. And so that's very nice, right? Because by varying the angle uh, of k with respect to line of sight, we can disentangle the B1 term and this retrospace distortion term, and we can actually measure F. So we can get around this issue of bias and actually measure the growth factor directly. So this is um, one of the very nice things about retrospace distortions and also about the effective field theory in the sense that it really proves to us that we do not need a bias coefficient here. So there are other physical effects which unfortunately can contaminate uh, this term, which I'm not going to discuss. Um, but there are other contributions at higher order which are definitely protected. Okay, so uh, this basic conclusion still holds. Let me open the chat. Um, sorry. Um, um, I. Um, there's a question, why do I say they're unbiased? So, so what I mean with they are unbiased on large scales, which means if I'm on scale sufficiently large so that I can forget about this gradient delta term, which corresponds to small k, right? Then Vg minus Vm is zero, and so they're basically unbiased. Okay, so in general, I need to take into account this correction. Similarly, as we included um, the the scale dependent bias and the effective sound speed correction. Um, and that I would definitely need to include in my power spectrum if I go to the next to the order. But on very large scales, this is the correct equation. Good. So basically, um, yeah, so this concludes the part of the lectures where I wanted to get to how we predict. Uh, galaxy clustering. Um, so now in the last uh, 45 minutes of these lectures, I want to um, I want to um, discuss how we can test um, how we can test uh, beyond lambda CM cosmology using using these probes. There was a question on velocity bias. Yes, absolutely, Renan. Um, this is ensured by the equivalence principle. So you can think of it as if I have really large scale uh, gravitational perturbations then all matter has to fall in the same frame and matter includes not just dark matter, but gas, galaxies, stars, black holes, they should all fall at the same rate and hence have no uh, velocity bias. So yes, excellent. Um, good, and uh, so let me start with dark energy. So basically, we've already now know how to incorporate dark energy. Um, 
because we know that it affects the growth factor, right? We can just plug uh, the evolution of dark energy into the Hubble rate and then solve the growth factor equation. And so that we know then how it affects galaxy velocities, which we can probe by Richard's space distortion. Uh, we can also probe uh, the growth sector using gravitational lensing, which I did not discuss, which um, I, um, yeah, Principal Dragan uh, will discuss. I discussed that with him, that uh, he will introduce gravitational lensing. And then finally, um, so that's the growth part, but then dark energy also changes, of course, the expansion of the, the universe. Um, and the growth effect is just one aspect of this. And um, this we can constrain by the BAO feature. Um, so uh, the galaxy power spectrum contains this very slight oscillatory feature, which is imprinted in the early universe by the coupling between variance and photons. And we basically know what the physical scale of this oscillating feature is. And it's not quite clear here, but if you um, carefully extract that feature, it's actually quite insensitive to this one loop corrections, okay? So that means it's a nice uh, way to, so we infer the observed K wave number that corresponds to that physical scale. And so by that way, we can basically convert our inferred uh, or apparent physical scale to, a, uh, to an underlying physical scale and that way get distances. Um, right. Um, so, okay, so then I want to discuss three more things. So obviously this is, these are all big topics on themselves. I just wanted to briefly uh, sketch how we can test these with logical structure. Um, neutrinos, primordial non gaussianity and modified gravity. Um, so starting with neutrinos, so we already had a few questions on neutrinos. So I see that several of you are aware of them. Um, so the effect of massive neutrinos. So if neutrinos were massless, they would behave as radiation throughout the whole history of the universe. And we could basically neglect their dynamical effect um, just as we neglect photons today, uh, because they're just in terms of energy, to uh, energy density totally uh, negligible. But massive neutrinos, um, they slow down and eventually become non-relativistic and start clustering, and then we cannot completely neglect their gravitational effect. So that changes both the expansion history because um, radiation has an equation of state of one third, right? Uh, um, pressureless relativistic matter has zero. So neutrinos transition from one third and zero and that affects the expansion history. Um, and they also lead to a scale and redshift dependent suppression of the total power spectrum of clustering components. So I include them here in the matter. Um, if you include them in the matter, then um, they lead to a suppression relative to the case where you had uh, no massive neutrinos uh, or just massless neutrinos. And so this plot shows uh, the ratio of the power spectrum with uh, neutrinos to the case of, sorry, with massive neutrinos to the case of uh, massless neutrinos. And you can see here the overall, I mean, clearly this effect is scale dependent and the scale dependence already begins on fairly large scales. So K much less than 0.1 inverse megaparsec. Um, and it's a few percent effect. So it's a small effect, but it's, uh, you know, using precision large scale structure is in fact measurable. And the suppression is, um, yeah, basically the relative suppression is higher uh, at a lower redshift because, um, you know, the effect builds up over time. So now if we measure the total clustering power spectrum using gravitational lensing, or we measure velocities using redshift space distortions, then we can in principle detect this effect and constrain it. And this is active, a lot of active work is going into modeling this effect precisely. And um, sorry, I'll, I think I have another slide, yeah. So um, currently I should say, the constraints on neutrino masses all come from the change in the expansion history. So currently we have no, this is not a very interesting probe yet, 
but with the next generation of data, it will be. And so then we need to be able to model uh, very precisely uh, what they do um, to, to large scale structure. And for this, there's been various analytical numerical um, approaches that have been studied. It's a little tricky because um, they're kind of between all the chairs, right? You can't treat them as radiation. You can't treat them as cold matter. Um, you can't treat them as fluid. Um, but uh, luckily, I think, you know, if we get this effect to ten, right to 10%, because it's overall just a two or 3% effect, uh, we should be fine. Okay, so we don't need uh, the neutrino effect itself to be extremely precise. And so for galaxy clustering, what we typically do, what we expect to be a good approximation is to say that um, galaxies continue to form in this joint cold CDM, I mean, dark matter plus baryon component, and we just neglect the, um, the neutrinos basically just influence them gravitationally, but the galaxies don't actively form out of neutrinos, which I think is a, is a very good approximation. Good, next topic, primordial non-Gaussianity. And uh, primordial non-Gaussianity refers to departures of the initial density field from uh, perfectly Gaussian distribution, um, right? And so that can happen if the infotone field was not purely a completely free scalar field, but actually had some interactions. And so there's a guaranteed level because we know that the infotone interacted gravitationally. So there's a guaranteed level of non Gaussianity, which is though very, very small. Um, so one particular nice property about single inflation is that fluctuations generated at a given time um, don't know anything about large scale perturbations that left the horizon a long time ago, right? So large scale perturbations leave the horizon first during inflation. And so for the, the point of view of the small scale quantum fluctuation as they freeze out, they don't know anything about the large scale perturbations. Um, I think Valerie will basically cover part of this, this question. So, so that means that there is no actual coupling between modes of widely different wavelengths. Um, so if I have primordial potential perturbations on some long scale L and on some short scale S, those two should be completely uncorrelated. Okay, why do I write here phi long, phi short squared? Well, this is kind of a, a technical thing because if I construct filters appropriately for long and short wavelength modes, um, they, they are linearly uncorrelated basically by construction um, because they have absolutely no overlap in, in Fourier space. Um, but the second order coupling uh, is, can be in general, can be present, but in single field it is not present. So, um, so this means basically, um, what does this mean? So consider a long wavelength perturbation, right? The small scale perturbations add on top of that. And in the case of no coupling between lo uh, long short wavelength modes, the statistics of the small scale modes here and here are exactly the same, right? So they have different random fluctuations, but the statistics, the typical amplitude here and here is exactly the same. This changes if you have uh, mode coupling, uh, which we call primordial non Gaussianity of the local type. Um, so an example is here, right? So if you have local type non Gaussianity, this case with a positive sign, um, so the gray line now shows what I showed before, and the blue line is with non Gaussianity, then in the peak of the long wavelength perturbation, there's a much bigger amplitude of fluctuations than in the trough. Okay, here the effect is exaggerated, but you can see here in the trough, there's basically no small scale fluctuations and here they're very large. Right? Um, so we, if we detect this effect in the universe, then we can say single field inflation is ruled out. That would be a huge thing, right? We would be able to say, more than one field was active 
during inflation. So how can we, uh, you know, can large scale structure say anything about this? And yes, it can, because we can basically look into the universe and follow galaxies and their clustering on large scales. And you can imagine that um, galaxies living, forming in a region, uh, I mean, there will, galaxies will have a much easier time forming in a region with small, with large fluctuations than in a region with basically no fluctuations, right? Consider uh, this um, circular collapse picture that we discussed, um, right? We were saying um, galaxies form or halos form wherever the density field crosses some threshold, right? And if you have large fluctuations on small scales, then uh, halos will have an easier time forming. So they'll be more numerous in the region where um, there's bigger small scale fluctuations. So I, I think this is pretty straightforward and, and not really surprising. The main issue, uh, the main surprising thing is that now this effect, if you have local primordial non Gaussianity, this effect is mediated by the primordial potential, right? Because this coupling was present during inflation. So when can that be? When you have several fields active during inflation. Um, and so, um, so basically what you can think of happening as happening is you have start with a standard Gaussian density field and now you rescale it in a location dependent way, depending on the large scale gravity, uh, primordial potential. So um, how does this, um, yeah, what's the effect of this? Well, um, so just to contrast this again with the Gaussian case, right? In the Gaussian case, the statistics of the small scale fluctuations, initial fluctuations was um, independent of the position, right? It was the same everywhere, independent of whether they were large scale perturbations or not. And so we incorporated these by adding the constant noise contribution. But with FNL, local type non-Gaussianity, this is no longer correct because delta S is correlated by the primordial potential. So we have to take this into account explicitly. You can think of basically as the noise now depending on the phi, the primordial potential at the position of where the galaxy formed. Fabian, so the, yes. Fabian, uh, I, I have a, a, a doubt. <laughs> Uh, about the non-Gaussianity in this context. Uh, in, in, for instance, in statistical mechanics, uh, a, a Gaussian distribution is related with uh, the equilibrium pro property of the system, the thermodynamic equilibrium of the system. In this context here, uh, there is some, some connection between non-Gaussianity and the irreversibility Oh, well, oh, no basically what happens, I mean, yeah, I don't want to get too much into what Valerie will discuss, but basically what happens is if you have two fields active during inflation, then um, at different, you know, you have fluctuations in both fields and uh, the amplitude of fluctuations in one field could depend on uh, how big... Um, the other field is at that location. Okay, so this is a bit of a technical point. Why couldn't this happen in single field inflation? Single field inflation, we have only one clock. So basically uh, having different large scale potential perturbations just moves you along at different points of the different number of E folds. But if you have two fields, you can think of basically the difference between the two fields as affecting uh, the small scale modes. Okay, okay, thank you. So you can think of different patches in the inflationary universe having kind of different composition, different ratios of field one and field two. Um, yeah, so this is a whole technical uh, subject that, yeah. Um, so uh, I admit I mostly aim to uh, claim if this thing is there, then we see um, a certain effect in galaxy clustering more than trying to explain where this comes from. Uh, 
Um, uh, good. So let me just refer the Trina question to the end, and uh, the other one I'll get to. So, uh, so basically, the end of the story, uh, the moral of the story is that now galaxy density at a given location also depends on the primordial potential at this location, or actually at the location where corresponding to the position of the galaxy in the initial conditions. So it's Q rather than X, but that's a, a, a technical detail. So, um, so what is so special about this particular term, right? Um, so first of all, it's only there, of course, if F and L, the amplitude of this non gaussian is non-zero. So this is so special because if you think of the relation between phi and the density, say in the linear bias term, there's a one over k squared in between, right? So this term becomes huge relative to this on large scale. So uh, the way it looks is, um, is like this. This is the plot showing uh, the power spectrum of some halo sample. Um, the solid line shows the case without F and L, and that's the just B1 times the linear power spectrum. Um, and now if you have F and L, then you can see a huge increase or suppression, depending on the sign of clustering on large scales. So this effect, um, right? So this means galaxies follow the potential rather than uh, matter on large scales. And this effect cannot be mimicked by gravitational evolution. Right, gravitational evolution also couples large and small scale modes, but that coupling is via the, the density, right? So small scale modes in an over dense region form differently than those in an under dense region, but that's density again, right? So that's this uh, the the effect we take into account with the B one term here. But the depends on potential is completely unique to something that it has to be imprinted in the initial conditions. Um, primordially, because no um, local gravitational or non gravitational physics could introduce that term in the bias expansion. So it's really a smoking gun um, signature of, um, of primordial physics. Um, yeah, and what's very interesting is that this is, effect is not only in principle there, but it will also is expected to improve on the current best constraints of primordial non-Gaussianity uh, that come from the Planck CMB results. So basically we're saying that in the future, uh, galaxy surveys will provide, uh, pr you know, will probe interactions during inflation as, or a specific type of interaction better than any other, other probe of cosmology. So I, I find that very, very interesting. Um, Yes, so uh, I think we already had that. Um, we briefly touched on that yesterday in the Q and A. So non Gaussianity is a wide field, right? Uh, we're talking about specifying the statistics of an entire field. Um, there are many, many variants of how the field primordial fluctuations could depart from Gaussianity. And um, this is the most this, this form of non Gaussianity that I described has the most striking effect on large scale structure. There are other shapes that are really looking very similar to effects from nonlinear gravitational evolution, and those will be very hard to constrain from large scale structure. Not completely impossible, but very hard to beat the CMB limits on those. Good. And uh, yeah, so uh, there was a question on um, on what about this B phi here? And that's, of course, a good point. So if we were to detect this effect, uh, the scale dependent upturn in the clustering uh, or downturn, then uh, we, of course, want to know what F and L is, right? Uh, that's the quantity that is comes from inflationary models. Um, and for that, we need to know B phi. So uh, that is um, that's of course tricky, and uh, we'll we'll have to think hard about how to estimate B phi for a given galaxy sample. 
but for now the goal is just to um, um, the goal is basically to find this effect and rule out single field inflation right? good okay so um, uh, sorry so there so next topic modified gravity so um, you are lucky to have um, uh, Pedro Ferreira lecturing next week so he will cover this topic in in quite a bit of detail I hope um, I just wanted to illuminate a few aspects for how Larska structure can constrain gravity. So when we want to modify gravity in cosmology, we have this a bit of a challenge, right? Because we uh, gravity is really well constrained uh, in the solar system today and also the early universe by the CMB, for example. So you want to modify it in such a way not to break these things because you immediately would be ruled out. Um, so, uh, so the idea is actually to reduce to GR in the high density or high curvature regime, and that solves both problems because both of these are high curvature regions relative to the background universe today. Um, one problem, one further problem we have is, you know, if we test gravity in the solar system, we have a pretty good idea that the mass is concentrated in the sun, and you know. Um, that makes the metric fairly simple. It has to be some spherical symmetric metric. Um, but in cosmology, we don't really know what T mu nu is, right? I mean, we're introducing this dark matter. Um, so uh, we're introducing maybe lambda. We don't really know what T mu nu is. So it's kind of tricky to disentangle uh, effect of gravity from changes to T mu nu. Um, so I want to make one basic point about modified gravity. So the simplest modification of gravity, which really captures almost all the scenarios people have looked at, um, is what's called a scalar tensor theory, where you say my metric is a rescale version of the metric that comes from out of the Einstein equations with the dynamical field phi. And if you do that rescaling, you find that the not not component of the metric is receives a correction from the field. So basically, non-relativistic particles um, follow, you know, notice this scalar field. But the combination of potentials that governs light propagation, so gravitational lensing, is unaffected. So that means we have, if we compare the motion of non-relativistic objects and lensing. Um, we can actually really test directly is there some scalar field, additional scalar field around, relatively independently of what um, the stress energy of the universe looks like. Um, so you can think of if I have a massive body and I have something orbiting it, I can measure the time time component of the metric, so psi. And if I measure the deflection of light around the massive body, I measure psi minus phi, and those t two are by order unity differently affected by phi. So we should be able to uh, to see that effect. Um, and that's actually how we do tests of gravity in the solar system too. Um, the orbit of the Earth sets the dynamical mass basically, and then uh, we look for light deflection around the sun or um, light signals to um, uh, spacecraft to the Cassini probe, for example, to to measure um, the, the the light propagation aspects. So what's the effect of oh, one other important point is that if I have a scalar field that acts as gravity, it's always attractive. OK, so it always increases structural growth. So that's good to know, because say sometime we see attention a hint that there's less structure in the universe than we expect uh, then that's unlikely to be modified gravity or at least will be very difficult because modified gravity increases structure so uh yeah and the 
uh, you know, of course, as I say this, I, I contradict myself here. Um, okay, let's um, let's look at the right panel first. So this plot shows the um, shows the non ratio of nonlinear power spectrum of matter from simulations in F of R gravity and lambda CDM, and you can see that it's it's increased on small scales um, due to the enhanced gravitational forces acting on matter. Uh, there's also strong signs of this uh, screening mechanisms, which I didn't describe, but um, Pedro will hopefully describe. So on the other side, I have another model, which actually you see there's less power. So I'm contradicting myself. So what's going on? Um, well, this model turns out to be theoretically inconsistent. Okay. Um, we simulated it here, but it's actually not viable theoretically because the scalar particle that we're considering here has a ghost instability. But so basically, just to point out, we can probe modifications of gravity by looking, for example, at the nonlinear power spectrum from lensing. Um, and even better, of course, is to do this comparison of dynamics of non-relativistic objects with lensing. And uh, for the, a few of you, maybe someone uh, followed very closely and noticed, wait, can't we do this with redshift space distortions, which probe this, and weak lensing, which probes this? And of course, exactly right. Uh, we can compare redshift space distortion and weak lensing and modify gravity would generically predict a discrepancy between the two. We can also look at massive uh, objects. So for example, gas clusters, we can try to measure their dynamical mass using the velocity dispersion of galaxies or X-ray or uh, sunyaev zelzovic effect. And we can compare that with um, the mass obtained from gravitational lensing. So um, I'm actually going faster than planned because probably I've been going too fast on this part. But um, I, uh, yeah, that was all I had actually already. So why don't we have an extended question session then. Okay, so if people have questions, they can ask in the chat or raise so I think there were already some. Um, the nature of neutrino. Um, okay, so so I talked about, uh, by the way, you can, can you see the, the slides or not? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, right, so I talked about the neutrino mass effect here, right? So what is assumed here is that uh, neutrinos have a thermal distribution um, with a certain temperature initially and a certain mass. So that, Thermal distribution is um, is relevant, um, but whether there are three neutrinos with the same mass or one significantly heavier than the others is basically has almost no effect. So we are basically always, when I write m nu here, it's the sum of the neutrino masses, right? So we're, that's basically what we're always constraining is this total sum of neutrino masses, disentangling whether there's like the different masses of the individual neutrinos, that would be amazing, of course, but unfortunately, uh, it's very hard to do. Um, yeah, then the issue of disentangling non-Gaussian signals generated primordially from those generated from the growth of structure, um, that, of course, is an important issue. And as I mentioned, it depends on the type, uh, I think, with local type non-Gaussianity were in very good shape to disentangle. Um, yeah, so Ademir asked about um, looking at skewness and kurtosis of the density field. That's of course, um, you know, that's the natural thing you would think of in quantifying non-Gaussianity the issue is that gravitational evolution leads to significant skewness. Um, so 
you know, it's going to be very hard to disentangle primordial signal from just the signal generated by gravitational evolution. So we so we try to do so. For example, and so the skewness is basically a summary of you know the three point statistics of the field. So what we can do is really directly look at the full three point statistics, three point correlation function or bias spectrum, and that will allow us to get a much better hint um, uh, in actually and in disentangling primordial and and uh, um, no, no Gaussian is from those that are evolved because it's, you know, you have the shape dependence. Um, I did not describe the bias spectrum. I am not sure if anyone will cover it in their lectures, but um, basically uh, unlike the power spectrum, which is just a function of scale, right? I always just show plot of P of K versus K. That's all there is. But if you look at the three point function, there are configuration dependencies. So, so you can look at what's called the squeeze limit or flat lim folded limit or equilateral configurations and different effects manifest differently in these shapes. Um, so then to discriminate between dark matter and modified gravity, right? That's an, uh, an excellent question. So in fact, you have to work very hard uh, to come up with a model that even vaguely explains our observed universe. So, um, so for example, I argued here um, that if you have a scalar tensor theory, then non-relativistic dynamics and lensing are affected differently, right? So the uh, first approaches to explain dark matter as modified, instead with modified gravity, Mond-like approaches, they introduced a scalar field that mediated an additional force. And that's fine, that worked for explaining the effect of dark matter on milk, the rotation curves of galaxies, but it didn't explain lensing, right? Because it didn't affect lensing and we see dark matter also in the lensing. So you have to work quite hard to make same field also have the same effect on lensing. Um, so it's, um, there's no, I would say there's no single effect uh, that you can say this rules out uh, modified gravity as explanation for dark matter, but it, it gets harder and harder basically with more and more observations, it just only gets harder. Um, so yeah, so um, there's a mention of the bullet cluster um, it's, yeah, I mean, naively one would say, I mean, at first sight one would say, okay, bullet cluster, uh, how can this, you know, the mass is not where the gas is, right? But even so, I mean, so these Mon theories have nonlinear field equations and it's conceivable that you could set up a configuration where that field somehow gets displaced from, from the variance. So, uh, Again, difficult because how do you prove you need to run a full simulation of two colliding galaxy clusters, including the gas in modified gravity. And to my knowledge, uh, that hasn't really been done. So um, yeah, I mean, there are many, many plausibility arguments pointing against it, but rigorously ruling it out is always difficult. So there is a, one question by Zakaria on the chat and then Renan uh, raised his hand and I also have a question. So, okay, so I can answer Zakaria. Um, so I would, um, yeah, so I try to explain, um, so there's two things is why, you know, explain this better. Um, there I would rather defer to Pedro's lectures because he really, it's going to talk about modified gravity. So how can we do this comparison between dynamics and lensing? I basically explained here, right? Um, so basically, if you think of, um, so, so the most straightforward test perhaps is this algae of this, right? So imagine um, I have a galaxy cluster and there's a bunch of galaxies orbiting in it. So I can measure the velocity dispersion of these galaxies 
And based on that, with some additional modeling, I can infer what mass is needed to keep the galaxies on this, these orbits, right? So that gives me a handle of psi. And I can also look at the background galaxies behind uh, the cluster. And the light from those will be bent due to the gravitational effect. So the you know, gravitational effect on, on light or you know, the effect of, on the photon geodesics. And, um, and that we observe via gravitational lensing. And so it's called gravitational lensing. And so we just compare the two, right? They, in GR, they should always, no matter what the cluster is made up of, should always give the same answer. But in modified gravity, we generically expect a very different answer. I hope that answers the, the question. Um, so then I don't know which order we want to go. Renan has a question. Okay, it is exactly the same question, <laughs> but I, I can complement. Uh, do you know uh, for uh, uh, an example of an observable which can compare these two uh, observables? <laughs> for instance, we can observe the surface mass density from weak lensing. We can mm -hmm. uh, yep. infer. Yeah, that would probe this. What I indicated was psi minus phi here. Yeah. Yeah. And and the same quantity from redshift space distortions, how can we? Yeah, so that's uh, right. So um, the, redshift, the other part that I um, described here um, or mentioned here, uh, not described, um, the works the following. So you consider you have a galaxy sample right? Um, and you measure its power spectrum. And so you get redshift space distortions that tell you how quickly those galaxies move, basically. And then you can also measure the lensing that these galaxies do um, by looking at their effect on, on background galaxy images, basically. And if you have modified gravity, then uh, those two effects um, basically should differ, whereas they should be the same in, in GR. So it requires a little more modeling. It's not quite as clean and simple, I would say. Well, in, in, in the theory, it's not quite as clean in principle as, as this test, where we look at one object and measure the non-relativistic motions and lensing. Um, it's, more, it's slightly more involved, but um, uh, yeah, uh, I, for the details, I need to refer you to those papers. Okay, and what about uh, performing this idea using voids? That is uh, measuring the redshift space distortions uh, of voids. I, I, we would start the the shape the the shape of the void and also the the weak lensing. Uh, Shear uh, induced mm -hmm. by voids. You think yes. it is possible? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so basically, what they proposed here, they applied it to galaxies, but you could do the same on voids. I completely agree. Yes. So you seem to already have quite a bit of knowledge. So I think you'll be able to follow uh, uh, these these papers. So I really suggest you know um, recommend to have a look at them and feel free to write me another question on Slack. Nice, thank you. So I think it's my turn now. <laughs> I, I'm not be able to participate in the Q&A, so ask now. Uh, you know, can you go back to your neutrino slide, please? Yes. I, want, I, I noticed, uh, so I would expect that when you include the nonlinear effects of, uh, in the uh, linear power spectrum with neutrinos, you know, usually gravity has this property of clustering things. So uh, I, th I think I remember from simulations, actually, the, uh, uh, you don't get this large suppression when you go uh, to simulations. And here, it looks like uh, you, you, when you go from leading order to next to leading order, you get more suppression. And that's, uh, well, that's what I don't understand. Well, yeah. 
Um, yeah, it's an excellent point. Um, one has to be really careful here in what one compares uh, always because it's such a subtle effect. So here, the next to leading order is NLO with mass neutrinos compared to, I mean, linear, leading order, linear plus next to leading order with mass neutrinos divided by leading order plus next to leading order with without massive neutrinos. So I think what one's seeing here is that, um, so there's this linear suppression, but then the loop integrals basically involve you know, two power spectra. And so that suppression, it gets even bigger in that case. Um, so yeah, I, I, but I fully admit, I don't know, uh, you know, a comparison with n body simulations where this actually is, is accurate. Um, we're talking here, few percent level things, right? It wouldn't, you know, one has to be quite careful. Uh, so neutrinos, it's really a subtle thing. It's um, one always has to think about what is being held fixed, right? Some people also compare, um, you know, cosmologies with neutrino mass and without neutrino mass holding omega m at red zero fixed, which of course then changes things completely um, or not completely, but significantly. So you have to really, I actually don't know what Aoife here um, held fixed, um, to be honest, quite honest. Okay, yeah, it's subtle, uh, yeah. But I, I just remember from simulations that uh, the effect of including gravity, you know, uh, nonlinear effects of gravity is to increase, uh, the so, so you decrease the suppression, let's say, I don't know how to, if it's clear, but it's just- Okay, so relative to a simulation without neutrinos. Uh, no, so simulations, so it's comparing an, an, um, a linear power spectrum with neutrinos and simulations with neutrinos to the same mass. Okay. And there you said the suppression was... The suppression, yeah, so... If you see in the linear power spectrum, the suppression is just, almost disappears. Right, but it, yeah, so I mean the diff one difference for sure is here that we're not dividing by the same things, right? Um, so, but uh, it, it will be worth looking into, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so I think Brian Castiblanco has a question about primordial black holes, how, how to consider the effect on clustering. Um, right, so um, yeah, primordial black holes are one possible candidate for dark matter. And they are a candidate because uh, they actually have very little effect on clustering. So um, basically, struct I mean, structure formation happens exactly the same, basically, with primordial black holes, except maybe, you know, they're on very, very dense regions. Uh, there might be effects of them forming binaries and then uh, and merging, but um, basically, yeah, structure is. Think of an n-body simulation, right? Um, we're using particles, particles that have a million solar masses or more, uh, sometimes uh, a billion solar masses, and it's fine for large-scale structure because gravity. Well, you know, once you go to larger scales where the coarse graining doesn't matter, um, gravity doesn't care about how heavy the constituents are. So uh, basically the, the answer is structure forms exactly the same way. Um, okay. Then uh, I think the question of Zakaria about screening mechanism, I think Pedro is going to talk about this at length. Uh, yes. So basically, uh, yeah, just to go back to my slide, since I mentioned it, um, so screening mechanisms um, basically implement this idea to reduce to GR in high density or high curvature regimes. And for that, you need some nonlinear mechanism. That's why we call them screening mechanisms. Okay, but great. more in more in uh, Pedro's lecture, yes. So, so, um, so great. I just, um, we're just on time. 
And since this is the uh, last uh, lecture of Fabian, I would uh, propose for everybody to open up their cameras and microphones. And uh, thanks, uh, Fabian, for the uh, gallery. Thanks, Fabian. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. much. Fabian, and uh, uh, so I'm Thank not. You. Q&A, but...